Good morning. So you'll notice that the, uh, the radio set clock is off because these buildings are ferro-concrete and the signal from, from Boulder, Colorado can't get into the building even though it's at 60 kilohertz. A megawatt at 60 kilohertz, I don't think you can't get into the building. So, uh, last time I talked about pick standalone stuff. We also are in the middle of, of Lab 4. Any questions on Lab 4? I've seen some interesting artifacts. And one of the artifacts is that you are going to want to have your PID update loop, your PID compute loop, with, which has a PWM output to the motor, to be at constant rate if you want to factor out the DT multiply, or you have to take into account DT in absolute terms. But if you want to do a constant rate, <clears throat> you want to go as fast as you possibly can. So going at 100 updates a second will make the system significantly more stable than 50 updates a second. I think it's what you found, right? Yeah. And why is that? Because a longer DT means a negative phase shift. It means a delay in updating the system, which is a negative phase shift, which destabilizes the control loop. So the faster you go, the better the stability because there's a shorter latency. Now, at some point, you're updating the system even though there's no new information, there's no new blade crossing. But, but I think you should aim for about 100 updates a second. And just like in lab three, you're going to want to use that delay scheme to make the, the loop isochronous. Any questions on lab four? There's lots of moving parts. One of the most interesting pieces of this lab is that layout matters. That if you have, if you have the sensor circuit, so you have your photo transistors here, and you have your op amp, and then you have a long wire going over to the microcontroller, and you happen to lay the SPI line for the TFT next to that, you get a significant amount of capacitive coupling between these two wires and it will affect the RPM measurement. <clears throat> so in the case of this particular lab, you have to worry about keeping the digital signals physically separate from the analog signals. <clears throat> you may find also that putting a bypass capacitor from VDD to ground as close to the op amp as possible may help you with spike noise because any spike noise coming down the power supply line to the op amp will get shorted out by this capacitor. And there's nothing like a microcontroller for making high frequency spikes. They are all, have you looked at the, if you want, if you want some entertainment, scope the power supply line and we'll see what's on there. There's everything up to about 100 millivolt, 40 megahertz spikes all over that power line. Just terrible mess. So shorting that out with a capacitor can help your signal to noise ratio. In general, wired into your brain should be the notion that every time you put an integrated circuit on a board, you put a bypass capacitor on it. Every integrated circuit should have 0.1 microfarad bypass. Putting it on is easy. Finding the noise related errors is 
awfully hard. Any other observations on lab four? Th weird things people have seen, instabilities. I apologize, we ran out of, of serial cables and fans, so we had to ask people to bring them back in, which most, a lot of people did yesterday, and I thank you for that. And um, it's the way it is, we just, we didn't have quite enough. I thought we had enough, but I somehow miscounted the serial cables in particular. We got a batch of fans in, I bought some extra fans, Turns out the fans, even though they're the same model from the same manufacturer, don't have the same controller in them, and they don't, they won't work with uh, pulse width modulation. So I've got 20 fans sitting up there that only work if you set the PWM to lower than 30 hertz, which I suppose you could do. Any other, any other comments about que uh, lab three or lab four? <clears throat> so I talked a little bit last time about running a PIC standalone for, because if in your final project you need more than one PIC, you only get one micro stick, you have to build your own target board. So we talked last time about <coughs> about constructing target boards. Any questions on that? I put together, I tried to plow through the documentation to, to put together a, a lecture on I2C. And it's not on here yet because I haven't updated the page. There it is, I2C. You'll notice that uh, this, is, this is cut and pasted off of the microchip site. They want to make sure they notice that it's a trademark because I think it's a trademark of Texas Instruments. And Texas Instruments uh, likes to make sure you know it's their property. But this is a bus designed to be on a single board, so it's a short distance bus. It's meant to have wires that are on the order of centimeters long, maybe a foot long, but not meters long. So this is not like CAN bus or Ethernet or something you could expect to spread around a building. This uh, the I2C is meant to be a very short distance bus. So I uh, um, tried to abstract some of the, of the various data sheets. It is, I2C is a, is a two-wire system. So the, the typical connection scheme would be a PIC32. And what do they what do they refer to it here as SDA data line and SCL a clock and then you hang peripherals off of off of this bus so the diagram shown in the in in the data sheet shows only one peripheral, but in fact you can have up to 128 peripherals on one bus because there's a 7-bit address. However, if you actually put 128 peripherals on one bus, it won't work because the path capacitance will be too high. So, but you could expect to put five or six peripherals onto the, onto the bus and have it work. However, the leading error, the leading reason that the students have for not being able to debug their I2C is they forget to put on the pull-up resistors. 
So these are external pull-up resistors. You cannot use the pull-up resistors that are on the chip. You have to add to the board a resistor in the order of two and a half to five K or so, but it's worse than that. The larger the number of peripherals, the smaller the resistance. But start out with around 5K or 2.5 to 5K someplace. It's two wire synchronous. And the nicest thing about it is that it's cheap. Two wires only takes two pins. The, 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 the least nice thing about it is that it's slow. The high speed version for most chips, for most peripheral chips, is 400 kilohertz max, which is two orders of magnitude slower than SPI. <clears throat> so this is great for temperature measurements, for, for audio rate retrieval of data from a ROM, but it's not going to work for video or for high speed synthesis. The other thing which is interesting about it is that the, the pins that run SDA and S clock, because the pull-ups are required, are open drain. Are open drain and slew, slew rate controlled because the bus is designed to ignore 50 nanosecond wide random pulses through the system. Like might come out, for instance, out of the CPU clock. So, so you can't use just any pin. You have to use the built-in I2C circuitry. And in any case, you want to do that because the state machine to make this go is hideous. And you want to use the hardware state machine. You do not want to write an I2C state machine. And I'm, on this page, or the, the page I produced, I'm only going to talk about single master systems where the PIC is the, is the master. And most of this is coming out of the reference manual. Unlike most of the stuff I've talked about so far this semester, I have never written code that used I2C. I would much rather use SPI. And I try and do everything in SPI because I find it much more straightforward, faster, and easier. However, there are peripherals that are only I2C. And we'll try and get them running. However, you should be prepared to spend about 10 to 40 hours interfacing a new chip that, you've, that you haven't seen before. And at least uh, several hours of that is going to be reading the data sheet until you have memorized it. One of the complications is that the data bus, SDA, is bi-directional. So part of the time the PIC is signaling, part of the time the peripheral is signaling on the same wire. And there has to be a scheme to negotiate who's transmitting and who's receiving. Which I find a little Baroque, but seems to be, seems to be, uh, seems to work well. The, the pick will always generate the S clock even when the peripheral is transmitting. So the PIC master is always going to produce the clock when it's sending data or when it's receiving data. On the PIC you can set the S clock frequency as high as a megahertz but most I2C peripherals won't go above 400 kilohertz and many will not go above 100 kilohertz. This is for noise rejection mostly. Each peripheral device has an address. 
the <laughs> the addressing scheme is interesting <coughs> some peripheral devices ship with a fixed address you could put this at any address you want as long as it's five so some some devices ship with a fixed address some ship with a partially fixed address the part that I showed up top here this 24 24 LC 256 EE ROM so this is a this is a, a, a writable uh, writable erasable uh, read-only memory um, ships with the high order four bits of the address set to 1010 and the low order the low order 210 address 210 set as pins that you hardwire on the board that means that if you use that specific kind of chip you can only put eight copies of it on the board before you run out of address so you can daisy chain eight of them on the same bus you could use another bus and put some more on but if you're using 24 LC 256's you can put eight of them on before you run out of address space seven bits why not eight turns out all transfers on the bus are eight bits the last bit of the address the low order of the bit of the address is reserved for whether you're going to ask for a read or a write so it's the read write bit becomes part of the address And so I looked up just a couple of different parts number. The, the, the uh, uh, ST24 series of EE proms uh, from Silicon Technology has a, uh, uh, what they call a hardwired hard address 1010. And interestingly, in the microchip literature for the 24LC256, what it says is that there are where does it say it it says that there are three pins which set the address and you look on the package here and sure enough there's there's there was where to go <coughs> well we'll get another copy of that one uh, there's there's three pins which set the address A0, A1, and A2 and it says three pins set the address later on in the data sheet this is a perfect example of how to shoot your own foot off with a data sheet later on in the data sheet halfway through the data sheet in a completely different section than the addressing it says oh yes there's a control code in the high four bits which is 1010 so it's really part of the address, but they call it a control code. So standards are good, but you ought to be compatible with your own standard, even if you're not compatible with anybody else's. But oh well. Now, where it gets interesting is that there's, first of all, a bus protocol, which is the electrical protocol of how you are going to manipulate levels on the bus and that's fairly straightforward I'll talk about it in just a minute and then superimposed on top of that is the message protocol which is specific and different for each different peripheral chip that you add to the system and the message protocol 
is where people usually spend the, the, the bulk of the 40 hours making the system work. Because the, the, this can involve register addressing, register reads, register writes to the peripheral device. It is typically completely arbitrary looking and annoying. But to go back to the bus protocol, the, the, the system can tell when the bus is busy because the clock is running. You can only start a transfer when the bus is not busy. The data line must remain stable whenever the S clock is high. So if the S clock is high, the data line has to be stable. Because if it's not stable, if, if the data line is not stable when the clock is high and it falls during that time, it says we're starting a transaction. That's the start transaction special symbol. The stop condition is a rising edge during the time the clock is high. But there are times for instance, when you're reading a read-only memory, where you have to do a transmit followed by a receive. So the master has to transmit an address and then receive a data back, a, a data, a datum, back from the ROM. And the master does not want to lose control of the bus. So there's a special command called a start-stop or a stop start. And a stop start is a stop condition followed by a start condition in the same clock cycle. Who thought that one up? And <clears throat> if you do that, it becomes an atomic write followed by read or read followed by write. So you don't, the, so the master doesn't lose control of the bus on a stop start. <clears throat> There's a couple of other bits required. Under various conditions, the master of the peripherals have to produce a NAC or an AC uh, a bit, which is required at the end of each transaction, so that it takes at least nine bit times to send eight bits. So the, so the, so referring to this, to this, there's a start data transfer. Oh, I already said, okay. Repeated start, data valid, acknowledge. Oh, they, there's a wait state and a bus idle state. So for the message protocol, this I mean, everything is now specific. It depends on the, on the, on the specific device, but for the EE prom, the very first byte of the message that you send has to be a go from idle to start with a start bit drop the clock you drop the data line during the clock high then you send 1010 which is their control code which everybody else would call an address then the A2 through A0 and then a read write and a zero in that position means you want to write because the first thing you're going to do is send the EEPROM address to the peripheral EEPROM. <clears throat> and oh, by the way, the, the EEPROM has to send back an ACK. Then you send two bytes of data, and the X here means don't care because there's not enough bytes in the ROM. An ACK is sent at the e, at the end of e, an, uh, uh, an ACK uh, is sent at the end of each byte, and now we have to switch to a read because we want to read back a data byte, and so we do a restart here, a stop followed by a start in one half of one clock cycle, 
we resend the address of the peripheral so now we have to resend the 1010 zero, zero, the three addresses but now we set the read write bit to 1 The peripheral then sends back a data byte and the PIC sends a NAC back. That doesn't mean no ACK, it just means a negative ACK. And then there's a stop event, which is a a rise in, 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 in the data line, then the bus goes back to idle. This is the part that it's hard to get right and you end up puzzling over for uh, hours and hours as you're trying to figure out why you can't get any communication between your, between your peripheral device and the PIC. Any questions on that? So there's, oh yes, and the, there has, there's a baud rate generator, a bit rate generator if you will, baud rate generator, and I, I, I really enjoyed this. So there's a, there's a piece called the, it's 1 over F clock minus TPGD minus times PB clock. What's the TPGD? It is the... It is the the pulse gobbler delay. Great name, <laughs> pulse gobbler delay. <clears throat> That's the PGD. So this is the pulse gobbler delay. Um, but in any case, what you're probably going to do is you're going to say, "I'm running at 40 megahertz. I need a 40. I need a uh, 400 kilohertz." Uh, bus rate, I'm going to set the baud rate generator to 2C and not bother to try and calculate it out. Interestingly, one of the, the, the Blimpo project, which was a uh, uh, three one meter balloons carrying a small platform. Uh, with a computer with a pick on it and three motors and and uh, and some ballast and other stuff accelerometers uh, set up and used the I2C with a three axis accelerometer and we scroll down through the pretty interesting reading here we find that down at the bottom is the appendix and they set up everything they they formatted the code in HTML which eh, okay that's alright with me I guess but if you look where they set up the they open the I2C channel 1 they're setting the baud rate to 9600 that wasn't in that table. That's a baud rate like you use with a serial terminal. So I got curious and converted that to hex, which is, I think, if I remember right, is 2580 hex. <clears throat> and it turns out the last two, bi the last, uh, two digits fall into the middle of the signaling range for, for the I2C running at 40 megahertz. So it worked by accident. If you have something that works when you turn it on, you don't debug it. <clears throat> but then when somebody else comes and looks at the code next to you, you say, oh God, it would have been a good example except it's 9600. 
So this is opening the I2C channel and it's setting idle to, it's setting the bus condition to idle. Starting it, idling it. It's doing a, uh, a few, uh, then a few uh, setups here. But I like the, the balancing robot project better that was using an IMU, an I2C IMU because they abstracted the, the, the code off into a I2C helper file, <clears throat> which defined out addresses, uh, register addresses for all kinds of interesting locations within the peripheral then figured out a way of doing an I2C weight. Well, that's pretty crude. We're doing, we're doing a countdown loop. So this is a spin weight. Hopefully you're not going to spin weight very many cycles. <clears throat> but that has high resolution since it's only two no-ops in assembler. They declared a, vo uh, a uh, I2C write at a rather high level which did all the slave address manipulation, all the peripheral address manipulation, starts it, idles it, does the writes for each of the bytes, checks for acts, stops it, idles it, and then, and then drops out. And they declared a read. So they, got, so they produced high-level read-write commands that abstracted away a lot of the bus nastiness so that it was possible to to uh, program at a higher level. You might want to take a look at that code if you decide to use I2C. Anybody ordering I2C parts? You will. What did the Blimpo product do? Pardon me? What did they do with the blimps? So this, so this was, this was just trying to make a controllable flying thing. And so they could fly it around the lab. Uh, they had a remote control. They had a, 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 a radio remote control. And you could vector thrust this thing around, the, around the, the room, which was pretty cool. It also used the thrusters. They didn't bother to balance this little platform. It was, it was foam core, just tied from the, to the center on the bottom of the, of the balloon. And they used the thrusters to keep it level. So that was kind of cool. It was, it was very interesting. The hardest part of the whole project, I think, was getting the balloons back from the mall in their car. I think, it I think they said it took six trips to the mall to get six balloons back, three and then three spares, because it filled the whole car. <clears throat> How big were they? One meter diameter balloons. We, just, we know someone who's trying to get blimps going and having some trouble, so maybe they could copy the work. Yeah, take a look at it. So the, the, so the final project, of course, op uh, .c opens the, uh, the, the I2C channel, and then I2C helper does all of the reads and writes. Uh, they did a bunch of interesting things in this, in this project, including using a... Uh, uh, a combination of accelerometers and rate gyros to make a uh, complementary filter that had good response but also was stable for, um, for different angles. Nice engineering job. Very nice. Clean. It was rigid enough to do what it was supposed to do. And uh, Oh, the other thing they did was to, over here on this corner, you can just barely see three potentiometers on the edge of the board. Those are the PID control uh, uh, parameter setters. So they could tune the PID controls just by turning the three potentiometers, rather than having to get a serial terminal up or anything like that. <clears throat> Oh, it looks pretty familiar. Yeah. Um, I believe that 
the motor driver in this case was actually a uh, 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 H bridge. Let's see. And one problem I had with this is I don't really call this a schematic. This is kind of a schematic and it's kind of pictorial. It's a hybrid. It's not really what we're looking for. We would like standard symbols as opposed to boxes on there. But it was good enough in this case. Let's see. Yeah, it was an MPU 650. Yeah, okay. So if you're going to buy, if you're going to buy an I2C device, accelerometer, what are the options for accelerometers? I2C, SPI. The easiest, analog. Takes the most pins, but it's the easiest to set up. So 80, so at 40 megahertz, 2C is 400 kilohertz and C2 is 100 kilohertz so 80 falls between those two so they're probably falling in the oh maybe 200 kilohertz range which happens to be a legal range but it was just dumb luck probably what happen is as people order these things up will uh, you what will happen is you'll print out the data sheet and then we'll sit in lab and scratch our heads and underline the data sheet and try and figure out what in the heck it all means and end up debugging using an oscilloscope. But the number one cause of bus problems is impedance problems because the pull-up resistors are not correct. Any final project questions? Next week I'll try and I, I'm going to try to to get something together for uh, <clears throat> um, talk about power down modes, which is making my head spin. It's it's really there's all kinds of pieces that have to fit together, and I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, famous safety failures in embedded programming. And what else would you like to hear about now that we're into final project time? Do you want to hear something, something on music synthesis? How do you generate, in fact? I mean, one of the things that's necessary for doing music synthesis is, of course, you have to get the spectral components right of the, of the instrument. So if you look at F versus amplitude, Oh, a, a, a freshly plucked guitar looks something like, like this, where this is the fundamental and this is 2F and this is 3F. You got some spectrum, but what makes it sound like a guitar is not only the spectrum, but the rate of change of each of the spectral components. So what you need to do is associate a time domain envelope to each separate frequency. The time domain envelope being some rise time followed by some decay time. So this is T and this is amplitude. And the, for a guitar, the, amp, the, 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 the second harmonic decays faster than the first harmonic and the third harmonic decays faster than the second harmonic. So to sound like a guitar, you have to get the initial amplitude ratios about right, and you have to get the decay times about right. <clears throat> so there's a lot of pieces you have to get right to make it sound good, although there is a really clever algorithm that was invented in the, in the 1980s, 
and therefore was running on the most pathetic little microcontroller you could imagine, an 8080, <coughs> which produced really good sounding guitar synthesis in real time. It's called the Carpless Strong algorithm. Carpless, Kevin Carpless was a faculty member here before he didn't get tenure. Went off to Stanford. Patented it. Oh well. Um, but uh, uh, the Carpless Strong algorithm bypasses all of these considerations of getting the ratios right by doing something much cleverer, it simulates the wave equation in real time on a damp string. And by doing that, it gets all of the effects simultaneously because it's the physics. And so the advantage, so the really cool thing about Carpel Strong is it said, well, we could do, we could solve the linear wave equation in closed form and do a lot of arithmetic or we could solve it as a finite difference equation and do a lot of arithmetic or we could solve it for traveling waves which is a a valid solution of a partial differential equation, linear partial differential equation and once you solve it as a traveling wave it is equivalent to a shift register and so you have a recirculating shift register. For the cost of a recirculating shift register, you've solved the wave equation. Which I think is very cool. But then, you know, it's personality dependent. <clears throat> so, uh, so doing physical synthesis of a string makes extremely good quality sounds. Doing physical synthesis of a drum in this class might be possible in 5760 is straightforward that's one of the one of the things I've had people do in the advanced microcontrollers class because then you have a two-dimensional wave equation but for a lot of synthesis we'll see if I can plug this in for a lot of synthesis what people use is is FM synthesis and you can do a fairly good job of synthesizing things that sound sort of like instruments by, by taking one sine wave and modulating its frequency with another sine wave. So for the cost of a couple of direct digital synthesis units and a couple of multiplies, you can make a pretty nice sound. And I've got a few examples I did for a synth I did once. Um, this is a 16-bit synth being simulated on an 8-bit microcontroller. Let's see if it's going to run. So that, that's FM synthesis. Oops, I closed my window. And you can do a, you can make pretty good string-like sounds, plucked and, and bowed string-like sounds, something that sounds vaguely drum-like or bell-like things that sound but but I mean you're not going to convince anybody who knows anything about instruments but it's pleasing sounds so you can so we could talk about FM synthesis additive brute force Fourier synthesis which will do anything if only you can figure out how to do it or we could talk about carpless strong physical synthesis or all three if you want to talk about that so think about that shoot me some email or, or a message on Piazza or however you want to do it about what you want to hear about. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about safety, 
talk about power management. And yes. No, go ahead. I have and uh, I I don't know what else. But go ahead. Did you hear about the iPhone Seven? What about the iPhone Seven? Two of them have caught on fire. Oh no. <laughs> so, what does this mean? Some surfer in Australia left his in his car and came back in his car was on fire. <laughs> so I guess you shouldn't surf in Australia. Is that the? Is it? It's the second case of it happening. Yeah. Wow. So. So. Is this? Do you think is, this is happening now because people are trying to pack too high an energy density into the phones? I don't know. I don't know. It sounded like it wasn't software though. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I think about putting lithium batteries in my house to collect solar power, and then I hear stories like this. I say, maybe this is not a smart thing to do yet. Anything else? I'll be happy to do a lecture on, on, on a topic related to somebody's final project if I can figure something out. You've got to give me a couple of days' warning. Otherwise, uh, I may try and make up a couple of more things. And sometime, probably after the end of next week, then we'll switch over to all lab time. But next week will be lecture. Monday, though, Monday morning, 8 o'clock, first parts order. Send me mail, one item per line, straight text. Nothing fancy, no formatting, no links, no, no spreadsheets, just simple stinking text. And I'll order it up. Okay.